Okay, so um, we're really going to focus on um, trying to be a speed reader wherever you can. Um, actually, when you're working with a database, typically you're working with a significant volume of data. Um, so trying to to read that data as intelligently as possible means that you can uh, try to be as efficient as, uh, as you possibly can. Um, and uh, certainly, uh, if you come to working with databases uh, fresh, um, then your typical approach to building a, a workspace in FME might be very similar to uh, how you uh, have worked with file and folder-based data sets. So um, very similar to the demonstration that uh, Mark highlighted, uh, this is a, a workflow that carries out some clipping, and the important thing here is that you make sure you adapt your, uh, the order of your readers so that, um, in this case, I'm reading some, uh, some municipal boundaries. These are uh, county boundaries, so you see that uh, if I view those uh, in the viewer, uh, you can see that, uh, that data there. And just to give you a little bit of context, um, some of you will probably be aware that you can drag in data into the viewer, so I can put a a TIFF into the view to see the, uh, the background data um, behind the, uh, the raster data, behind the, uh, the vector there. Um, and I'm using a tester uh, to guarantee that I'm reading the data in. Uh, I'm using the tester to, uh, to fish out uh, the Cambridge boundary for my workflow. And then my other reader is an Oracle database, so I've got a local instance of Oracle. And um, I'm going to read in all the data from that database table. This is a Sites of Special Scientific Interest. And we had a question while Mark was talking about getting rid of attributes. And my um, uh, sort of statement whenever I'm talking to anybody about working with FME is that if, you, if you're not going to use it, then lose it as soon as possible. Uh, so if you have a significant number of transformers in your workflow, at the point that you can get rid of attributes or you can downgrade geometry, uh, then do so. For example, it's quite common that you might want to uh, work with a, a center point of a polygon. Um, well, don't carry the polygon all the way through to the end and then extract its center point. Get uh, changed, coerce the geometry as, as soon as you can. Um, here you can see that the viewer has popped up, giving us the results of that clip. Uh, and essentially, uh, if we go and inspect the log, um, just as Mark was doing, you can see that here we've got a sort of a, a sub-30 second uh, run um, processing. But reading all of the uh, the data from that TRIPSI uh, data set, so nearly 9,000 uh, sites of special scientific interest there. Um, so what uh, the, the key thing to this workflow is to, to start to uh, become an FME hero and uh, work with parameters. Uh, parameters in FME really allow you to have uh, superb granular control over what you're doing with your workflow. And uh, as a desktop user, and run allows you to uh, initiate and, and send a parameter at runtime. And certainly if you're an FME server uh, user, then you'll be very familiar with uh, parameters because they're integral to how your, uh, uh, your workspaces run in the server environment. The key thing, though, really is to try and get the database to do the heavy lifting where possible. Uh, the database um, is generally optimized to do uh, some of this heavy um, uh, joining and spatial relationships. Uh, and if we can get that uh, work carried out uh, on uh, the database where possible, uh, then it, uh, it's more efficient. Uh, I'm going to show you a few ways um, that we can use uh, a handful of different parameters, in this case to issue a where clause to the database and also to, to work with uh, the different tables that are in the database. Um, and uh, we will really embrace the spatial index when it comes to databases. Um, if you go and have a look at uh, uh, what a spatial, uh, a spatial index is, a number of databases, uh, spatial databases support those. Um, they're a way of optimizing your spatial query. So you don't have to read absolutely everything in your database table. You can go and pluck out just the geography or the area of interest uh, that you want to work with and read that part of the data uh, into your workflow. So reading uh, within your area of interest, an interesting fact is that since FME 2011, every reader has had the ability to read a bounding uh, area um, with, um, with the, uh, the format readers. The one thing to note, though, is that whilst every reader allows that, uh, not all uh, formats have a true spatial index. And therefore, 
you are getting some benefit in that uh, what you're doing is reading uh, only the data that you're interested in into the workflow and therefore that is in memory uh, and, and, and a smaller amount of data will be in memory. Um, when you move to working with a, a spatial database though, uh, a true spatial index really does give you a, a significant benefit because the read time is, is uh, so much faster. Now, of course, you can use your, uh, your usual DBA tool. Um, I've got SQL Developer um, on my machine that uh, I will use um, when I'm working with, uh, with Oracle. But, um, of course, if you're loading the data directly into, uh, uh, into the database with FME, whatever it is, uh, most of the writers have the ability to generate the spatial index after the data is loaded. So if we um, dive over to, uh, to Workbench and take a look at a... A variation on that uh, initial workbench. You can see it looks very similar, um, but what I'm going to focus on are the parameters that we have on the uh, on the Oracle reader. You can see that I have some uh, bounding uh, information here that uh, we're going to pull in, and um, if I prompt and run, these are published parameters, and I'll show you how we can do that in a, in a second. Um, and um, what I'll do is specify the area that I'm interested in, in reading from, um, and that will just give me a, a very small uh, clip region to, to work with essentially. So if we pull the uh, the other uh, the upper right hand corner of the bounding box, uh, and we've got an option here to click uh, clip to search envelope. Now if we say no to this, uh, it will essentially be an intersection. We'll get uh, the data back uh, that intersects with the bounding box. Box if we choose a yes, we'll do a hard clip of the geometry. Um, if we run this now. Uh, we were trying to beat about 26, 28 seconds on the previous runtime, and uh, the theory is that this is now going to read the, uh, the geometry from the, uh, the database table, and we've uh, now nearly, nearly cut that by, uh, by two-thirds uh, to read just the area of interest. Essentially, we, we read out the Cambridge area, and then we hard-clipped it to the specific boundary uh, of interest there. You can also take that one step further. Um, we have a WHERE clause uh, on the reader as well. And this, uh, again, and if we create that as a user parameter, it then is available to us on the prompt and run option. So we could query here uh, where a particular attribute uh, is uh, specific to a, a certain value. It's quite common that you have a type or a classification field that you would run a query against. Um, so you might do a, a string query and say where type is equal to high, medium, or low, and just bring those values back. In this case, it's a, an integer that I'm looking at, a physical area. Um, and uh, we're going to run that, uh, that query. It issues the, the where clause uh, to the database, reads the data in the bounding box, but only where the area in hectares is greater than 50 uh, hectares. And now you can see that we've knocked another second or so off that, off that workflow. Um, all the time, sort of, chewing down the, the time that you're taking to read and consume the, the data. And the cases, as soon as they're published, they're available for you to dynamically set. And speaking of dynamic, um, one of the other um, very uh, useful capabilities that not everybody spots, but uh, when I discovered this a few years ago, it makes a significant difference to the speed in which you're uh, processing your data, especially when you're uh, doing testing, when you're building your workflow to begin with. And that's the feature types to read parameter. Um, essentially what this allows us to do is um, uh, pick different uh, layers or tables from our database that we want to read. Um, and um, what you'll notice is that in conjunction with uh, dynamic capabilities, so that's a keyword to, to search on Ethnopedia for, a resource that um, I'm sure Ken will uh, remind us of at, at the end. Um, if we determine a dynamic property on the, on the target, it means that whatever schema is read will get written. And that really allows the feature types to read parameter to come into its own, because at the moment if I double click it, it's sort of hard coded to allow me to only read the one table from the database. If, however, I dive into the reader and merge the source feature type, that makes the, uh, the feature types to read parameter much more dynamic because it goes and hits the database at runtime and tells me right now what database tables are available to me to process. Um, now, the beauty of working in a, a database environment is that these are multi-editing environments with lots of different people contributing to the database. So um, you could, every time you open this workspace, 
essentially process a completely different database table if you uh, require it. Here I'm going to read in the, uh, the monument data uh, from the, uh, the monument tables. These are scheduled monuments in the UK, and if I just run that through, uh, it'll carry out the same process. And this time you can see that we have uh, few um, large scheduled monuments, but if we click on this one up in the northern part of uh, the county, uh, we can see that if we go and inspect the feature in a little bit of detail, uh, we've got a, a Roman uh, walled town uh, and uh, hill forts there that we've, uh, we've pulled out of the workflow. So um, we're trying to be as rapid as we can, but also as flexible as we can, and uh, really just removing any, uh, any features that we don't, uh, we don't need in our workflow. Um, on, on read before we even get them into the, the workspace itself. So um, using a where clause and working with SQL is, uh, is sometimes new to people coming to fresh to databases, um, a, a particularly useful resource that uh, I've, uh, I've found is the w3schools.com website um, and uh, a number of beginners resources for writing good SQL code on there. Um, and uh, really, uh, just a reminder of that feature types to read capability, it really allows you to always see what's new in your database. So a, a couple of tips on, on that front. Um, when it comes to um, working with uh, transformers in FME, uh, there are all sorts of different types of transformer that are out there. Uh, not least uh, a grouping of transformers that are sometimes uh, affectionately referred to as synchronous reading and writing transformers. Um, they basically allow you to read data partway through a process, um, sometimes triggered by an input feature. So you don't always have to rely on a reader, a specific reader or a specific writer. And certainly when you're at, uh, coming at FME as a, as a database person, um, you may want to uh, you know, query the database in the way that you've been used to by writing some SQL uh, code. And uh, transformers like the SQL Creator and the SQL Executor are very useful for that. Um, when it comes to working with raster data, the raster reader is incredibly useful when you want to build a file path and specifically pick out a raster image from a particular folder and only read that one uh, for your particular workflow. So all sorts of uh, transformers to, to take a look at in this classification. I'll open up and uh, view a, uh, a few of those uh, so you can see what I, what I mean. Uh, so um, the SQL Creator here at the top, there's three small demos in this one workspace. The SQL Creator um, allows me to uh, write a query that hits my database. So um, I'll choose um, an Oracle Spatial Database, and you'll notice that the parameters are automatically getting filled in for me because I've set that as my favorite, my default uh, database in this case. Um, and I can write a SQL statement. And this is uh, very useful because I've got a, a dynamic table picker that allows me to go and query um, all of the columns from the, um, the SSI, uh, Science of Special Scientific Interest Table. But much more importantly, I can be more specific. I don't necessarily want to bring everything in. So I'm going to choose to make sure I bring back the geometry. And if you don't want to type, then you can pick. So I'll bring back uh, the area column and drop that into the workflow. Let me just do that. Uh, there we go. And uh, we'll also have the, uh, the triple SI name, which we'll bring in as well. I'll just sort out my syntax a little bit. Um, and uh, pulling those both from the admin table, and I've dropped into here my where clause. So where area uh, it is spelling sensitive, that's for sure. So area greater than 1,000. Um, and now we can populate uh, the, uh, the attributes that we want from the query. So uh, these will be the attributes that get exposed. Uh, so it's going to hopefully pull those back for me. And that's a, there we go. We've got that. Uh, and then you can see that they're now available. So um, if I run this workspace now, it will literally uh, hit the database uh, with that SQL query and uh, pull back only what that query returns. Um, no reader in sight in this case, um, and uh, a, a very useful uh, little process to, to bring back those, uh, those larger sites of special scientific interest from that workflow. So if we just move on a little bit, so I'm going to disable all objects in the bookmark and move down to the next part of this workflow here, looking specifically at the feature reader in this case. Um, and uh, we'll just make sure that uh, our uh, input data set is enabled. This is a SQLite database, 
Um, I'm reading in my counties again here and testing this time for a different area. We're going to grab the Greater London Authority area. And the feature reader um, receives that feature and uses it as a trigger, as an initiation uh, to, to go and pull some data from a SQLite database. Um, and I'm picking data from the monument table in this case. Um, and um, I'm querying specifically from the, uh, the feature type that I've just defined, but you can specify different ones here as well. Uh, you can also see that my where clause is available for me to use that as well. Um, and then we can select features in this case that intersect the uh, bounding box of the initiator. However, it can be more interesting if you're actually working with some of the spatial predicates that are supported. And um, the ones that are listed uh, in the transformer here are uh, generic ones that are, you're able to use on any database. But um, if a uh, particular spatial predicate is supported natively by your particular format, then uh, it is more efficient to use that one. Uh, so uh, you will see them in this list prefixed with the format name that uh, uh, you're working with at the time. So in this case, we're going to bring back the result attributes and geometry uh, and uh, return those. So we'll read the data. The, uh, the feature will initiate the query and bring back only the features that, uh, that interact with that. Um, so again, the feature reader, very useful. There's my initiator feature, and there's uh, essentially a bounding box that represents all of the data that uh, has been returned uh, on the, uh, from that monuments table in the, in the SQLite database. Um, down at the bottom here is the SQL executor, which I'm not going to focus on, but I'm going to mention because uh, that is a particularly useful transformer that works in a very similar way to the feature reader. Um, but it does allow you to work with some of those spatial predicates that your, um, your process, your particular format uh, supports. Uh, so you'll see the configuration is very similar to the feature reader. We have an initiator feature. Uh, we uh, add a little bit of a, a query into that workflow, um, and uh, it allows you to, to go and uh, to bring back any of the data that you're interested in. Um, one of the, the links here, um, if you uh, take a look at uh, FMEpedia, uh, so if I just bring that through, there is an FMEpedia article on this topic that's very useful, and uh, the title of it is uh, is how to use native spatial database SQL commands to perform spatial queries. Uh, so a nice snappy title, but uh, it's a, a very useful article to to read up on uh, over on FMEpedia. Um, just uh, to finish off then, really um, on the uh, the database front. Um, one thing that uh, I haven't mentioned is that you can also, of course, go and speak to your friendly DBA. Um, working with uh, a database means you've probably got a, a database assistant or colleague uh, that manages that environment. And actually, if you can get that person to create you a view of your data, um, then a view is a, essentially a virtual table that's uh, uh, derived from a, a stored query. And every time you run your process, you create that query and get back the data dynamically. And all sorts of joins and attributes can be pulled back in a view. Uh, and if you can get that work done on the database, it's optimized to do it. And it can make your workspaces simpler, but also more performant, because you're getting what you need. Um, the uh, the, the uh, extra part of that is that on some of the more corporate database environments, uh, materialized views are also available. And that's where the query itself is actually stored on disk, and it's updated at a, a frequency that you decide on uh, by some sort of database trigger. Um, and that, uh, because the, the data is actually stored on disk, the results coming back on, it's significantly quicker again. Uh, so worth, uh, worth considering. Just to, uh, to complete my section then, looking at database joins, uh, databases, um, uh, when you want to, to join your geometry or your non-spatial features that you have passing through your workflow uh, to a database or to any environment, really, a uh, number of transformers to take a look at. The joiner versus the feature merger. There's a grand list blog, Article 79, which I'd recommend you take a look at, uh, comparing the, uh, the two transformers and some of the sister and brother transformers to the joiner and feature merger and how you might uh, make use of those. Um, there's also a, a transformer that I've made a, a good bit of use of. It's the inline querier. And it, it's a particular favorite of mine because it, uh, it actually allows you to uh, cache your data to disk mid-process, which allows you to pull data out of memory. Um, and that's sort of a byproduct of, this, uh, of its intended use. Really, 
Um, the main part of the process of this uh, use of this transformer is that under the bonnet it has a SQLite database and midway through your process you can take um, non-database formats and put them into a, data em a database environment and then write standard SQL um, against that data. So it's, uh, it's a very interesting transformer.